Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Mormonism with the Murph, where we do a fair and objective analysis of the church and its truth claims, its history, doctrine and policy. And I'm really excited to have with me uh, Jim Bennett, who is the author of a faithful response to the CS letter. Jim Bennett, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, so Jim, for some people may not know who you are, so we're going to get him to introduce himself. Uh, but Jim has also been on uh, a few different podcasts. He's been on Mormon Stories. He had a, what was it, like 14-hour interview discussion with John DeLynn. You're also on Mormonism Live with RFM. You've been on Mormon Discussions with Bill Real, Midnight Mormon. So this guy, he's uh, he's not afraid to go on and have the tough discussions and be asked the hard questions. Can't shut up is what you're trying to say. <laughs> so but you're, def you're definitely someone who I admire for your willingness to have dialogue and discussion and you're not afraid to be asked the tough questions and you're somebody who has tackled uh, the CS letter and tried to do a response. And really the purpose of this interview is to, we're going to dive in and just talk about the questions in the CS letter and Jim Bennett's responses to them and just have a, a good dialogue and discussion. How does that sound, Jim? Sounds great. Yeah. So before we get into the your CS letter response, can you tell some of my audience who may not know who you are uh, a little bit about you know your background, uh, talk about you growing up in the church. Uh, I believe two of your great-grandfathers were presidents of the church, so tell us a little bit about that. Uh, and then your mission, because you went to Scotland on your That's mission. That's right. Which, yeah, which... Not That's too fun. far from where I'm from, <laughs> just so, across so where the pond. Are you, where are you from? You're Northern Ireland. You're from Northern Ireland. Okay, yeah. I had a mission companion from Northern Ireland. Oh, really? Who was yeah. it? Uh, his name was Carl Hamilton. Oh, right. yes, I know. I know. I know him. Uh, I'm very close friends with his daughters. Oh, okay. That's well, very that's interesting. How old I am? <laughs> yeah. We were missionaries together in in Scotland. He's a he's an interesting guy. That's right. Yeah, that's that's Scotland. a good word. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll hear all about that. So we start us off. Tell us where you're from. Tell us about your family background and growing up in the church. Sure. Sure. Well, yeah. I I uh, I grew up. I've been a member of the church all my life. I grew up. Pe people don't realize they assume that I grew up in Utah because my father was a senator from Utah for 18 years. But uh, they moved back to Utah. Most of my parents are from Utah, and they moved back right after I graduated from high school. Uh, and I stayed in Southern California, which is where I grew up. I grew up in Calabasas, which is the land of the Kardashians. Uh, they got there oh, after I left. So uh, you can't blame me for the Kardashians. <laughs> uh, Kanye West tried to change the, the mascot of my high school. He donated a lot of money to Calabasas High School and wanted to change the mascot from the coyotes to the wolves. Oh. And, uh, the, apparently, we, we Calabasas coyotes stood strong, and it's still the coyotes. But uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, so I grew up in Southern California. So I grew up sort of away from um, the center of Mormondom. Utah uh, bubble. From the Utah bubble. And, uh, and I grew up away from the kind of expectations that um that i think being um a descendant of two prophets uh would have placed on me although i did sort of feel the weight of that yeah david o mckay is my mother's grandfather and heber j grant is my father's grandfather um and um you know so i i kind of always grew up thinking geez these guys are just such heavy hitters and I'm just this schlub, you know, what chance do I have? And I talked a little bit about that in, in, uh, in my conversation with RFM, but that's, that's a whole right. Other. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, I, um, I served a mission in Scotland from 1987 to 1989. So you can do the math and figure out that I'm an old man. <laughs> and I, um, I married, I have uh, five children um uh i sing in the tabernacle choir uh and you know i i've lived a really sort of normal boring life i've run for office three times and lost three times the last time by 21 votes Ooh. which which was really kind of painful but uh um uh, i was i i don't know so, so you want me to talk about 
CES no, that, letter? No, that's good. So um, you also told me when we talked on the phone before we talked about the CES letter, you said that you experienced a faith crisis yourself. I think it was before your mission. Yeah. When you watched the film, The Godmakers. Uh, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about film. that? I read, the, I read the book. I've never seen Oh, yes. Movie. Okay. So I was, I, I went to the University of Southern California. I was going to be a world famous actor. I was a theater major. Uh, you know, that qualifies you to work at some of your finer fast food restaurants. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I um, w- went to the USC library. I, I had an evangelical roommate my freshman year. And uh, uh, I went to the library at USC and checked out a copy of The Godmakers, which was a book, a uh, very breezy, easy read. I mean, it's not this big, lengthy it's about as long, I think, as the CES letter. Okay. And um, and yeah, it shook me to my core. It was terrifying. It, it it outlined a church that was far more exotic and and wild than the relatively boring church that I'd grown up in. Yeah. Uh, and, and it uses a lot of, I think, a lot of the same sorts of arguments against the church that the that the CES letter does. But it's coming from a different perspective. It's coming from the perspective that the church isn't just false. The church is a satanic cult. That Satan uh, is at the heart yeah. of it. They, they, so really, they really attack the, the temple ceremony. And yeah. The doctrine of like exaltation and becoming gods. I remember that when I listened to it. And yeah, they really try to paint it not just like it's the church isn't true, but the church is evil. Right, right. And this was terrifying, and it was it was my first exposure to a lot of uh, a lot of things, uh, particularly the temple. Uh, I had not gone through the temple when I read the God Makers, and I, um, you know, I, I I felt like a chump. Yeah, I felt like how is it that I grew up in the church and I didn't know any of this, and. And so as a result, yeah, it, it really kind of shook me. And I was trying to wrestle with whether or not I was going to go on a mission. I didn't really want to go on a mission. Um, I, but uh, I had resources, I think, that a lot of people in the church don't have. One of them being a very patient and very understanding father uh, who understood a lot of these issues and was, and was able to talk them through with me. Uh, That's pretty and, good. And to do so in a way that was not, uh, you know, I wasn't condemned for asking the questions. I wasn't condemned for reading this book. How dare you? You know, there was none of that. Uh, I also, at the time, was living with my aunt and uncle. Uh, and my uncle was the state president in Los Angeles, a man by the name of Howard Anderson. And he was cut from the same cloth as my father in terms of his ability to patiently uh you know walk through these kinds of things so i had a sounding board to be able to talk about a lot of this stuff uh but one of the things that really sort of turned the tide for me is i went home for christmas my parents had moved to salt lake city and so i i went home from los angeles to salt lake city and um for whatever reason in the elders quorum the sunday i went they passed out copies of a book called The Truth About the Godmakers by Gilbert W. Scharfs. Oh. I didn't have any idea who Gilbert W. Scharfs is. I ended up meeting him later after my mission yeah. and thanking him for his book. He was an institute teacher, uh, a CES director, if you will, uh, <laughs> at the University of Utah. And uh, it, it essentially went through the Godmakers line by line. And uh, gave a response to it, uh, very measured, uh, intelligent response. And it wasn't so much that Gilbert W. Scharfs had all the answers. It was that Gilbert W. Scharfs demonstrated that intelligent and thoughtful people could look at these issues and come away with a testimony on the other side. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that was enough for me to sort of put a break on my panic and say, okay, uh, I don't have all the answers, but, but I, I have time to search for them. You know, I didn't make the leap out of the church at that point. It was, 
okay, other people, intelligent people, thoughtful people, my father, my uncle, Gilbert Scharfs, have looked at these issues and uh, they're still believers. So maybe there's still something here. And that was enough yeah. for me to be able to kind of anchor my faith and come out of the of the faith crisis uh, with, I think, a stronger faith. Uh, on the other side Probably of more refined, more thoughtful. Faith, more thought, faith sure. Challenged. Sure. Um, and I think that's important, isn't it? Because, um, you know, there's that famous quote that like proof or, or evidence won't necessarily cause you to believe but lack of a defensive argument lack of it can cause someone to lose faith if they're having their faith challenged i know uh elder Donnelly shows give a similar quote to um i think some cs directors or something like that and i think that's important for there to be a a, de a defense uh, and would you say that response you let you read uh to the god makers did you feel like that had an influence or possibly inspired you to write your response to the CS letter, having seen a, that and how huge, it impacted huge, you? Huge influence. I mean, I, I, I huge influence. That, cause that's exactly how it happened. Yeah. Uh, I had a cousin that had left the church as a result of the CES letter. Uh, you know, you know for, for a long time, I was a blogger. I, 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 I haven't blogged for years now, but for about 10 years, I just blogged about everything, not just religion, but uh, pop culture, politics, just, you know, I had a blog at stalliancornell.com. It's still there. You can read all the stuff there. Uh, but, um, but so in my online wanderings, I, uh, I kept bumping into people who kept talking about this CES letter. It's like, oh, well, I, you know, I left the church because of the CES letter. And I thought, geez, this CES letter must be the most devastating attack on the church ever. And I thought, okay, let's see it. Bring it on. <laughs> and so I went out and, and read the CES letter, and I kept getting Godmaker's flashbacks. Yeah. I kept saying, I, because so many, I mean, Jeremy frames the argument far differently than the Godmaker's does. But in terms of the basic premise of it, uh, both the Godmaker's and Jeremy Runnels uh, are relying, I think, a lot on Gerald and Sandra Tanner who were the original gangsta uh, anti-Mormons, I guess. Yeah. I don't like to use the phrase anti-Mormon so much, but... Uh, but they're the Tanner, like the, the pioneers of the critics. The, the pioneers of the critics, sure. Yeah. And so they're both sort of using those same... They, they both rely on the same source. Uh, and the arguments were very similar, very much the same. And so what I did, I didn't sit down and go, aha, well, I'm going to write a reply to the CES letter. Uh, what I did was I went through the 10 years of my blog and went, oh, here's Jeremy Runnels talking about the Kinderhook plates. I wrote an article about the Kinderhook plates. And so I started sort of copying and pasting pieces of my blog into the CES letter. And yeah. as I did that, I went, you know, somebody ought to do with the CES letter what Gilbert Scharfs did with the Godmakers. Uh, there were responses to the CES letter when I started writing. I think fair uh, did a response fair well yeah fair has done a response and they they've actually got some new they've got a new response that takes a more line by line approach by a woman named sarah allen i think and i've, I've read right. some of her response but i haven't i haven't read the whole thing yeah because i know on his website he's got a list of people he's debunked yeah. i think i saw her name on it you're on there i yeah uh, it took him a while and this is the show are on there it took him a while to get to me. And by the time he did get to me, we had, we knew each other and he told me it was coming yeah, and, and asked me to respond to the response. And, and, you know, I, I started going through it and I started responding line by line to his line by line response to my line. by line. It felt like I was reviewing the fine print on a mortgage loan. I mean, it was just so reductive. And so, and I just thought, I don't want to do this. I don't, I mean, if you're getting this far into the weeds, I, I don't know that it's that helpful. And so yeah. what I wrote, so Big I wrote, project. well, I wrote a, an overview that he tells me, and I haven't even looked, I should look, but he tells me he's put in his response and it was an overview to his, his response. His biggest problem with my response to the CES letter 
is that he says, I'm not representing Mormonism. I'm representing Jim Bennett Mormonism. Mm. Uh, so, so I, he, I'm, he says this, this isn't really what re, what Mormonism really is. And so my overview response was, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. I'm representing Jim Bennett Mormonism. And there are as many different versions of Mormonism as there are Mormons. Uh, you know, that's how this works. Faith is a very personal thing and people, you know, and that really was the purpose of putting together the reply. It was to give people the same kind of tools that I felt like Gilbert Scharfs had given me. It was to say, look, this, this is not the definitive answer. I'm certainly not speaking for the church. I'm certainly, I don't have all the answers. This is how I've done it. Yeah. This is how I've confronted these issues and I've come away with faith on the other side. Your mileage may vary. Your mileage will vary. And that's just fine. That's, that's I think, what the, the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. So, And I, I admire that you, I said this at the start, that I admire that you're somebody who, you know, you're not a scholar. You're not a historian. Um, I don't know if you would go right. by being an apologist. You're a member who's probably done a spare shower research, who has gone through a faith crisis, and you've just taken upon yourself to try to respond to this which um, yeah. is, I think, admirable. And I think the fact that you've had dialogues with different critics is also a sign of, you know, your courage as well. Um, and I like what you said earlier about, because some people who go through a faith crisis, whether it's by reading the CS letter or, or a podcast, sometimes they can feel um, judged or they can feel like, oh, you shouldn't be asking questions. You shouldn't be worrying about these things don't go looking at the internet don't look at what critics have to say you know just just forget about it and i think there needs to be you know dialogue there needs to be openness like how you felt with your father who you know listened who helped you try to navigate through those things and i think that's important for people who who are in faith crisis now we're going to talk um a bit about your experience with jeremy runnels um, but okay. in your CS letter response, so for anyone who doesn't know what the CS letter is, basically Jeremy Runnels, he was a member of the church. He served a mission. I believe he was married in the temple. Then he went through a faith crisis when he was researching church history. Was it around 2012? He, he, his grandfather, I believe, said that he had a friend who was a CS director. And he said that he could ask all of his questions and all of his concerns with church history and the church's truth claims to the CS director. So he compiled what 80, hundred page document with 10 or so topics highlighting, you know, all his criticisms, questions, concerns with the church's truth claims and church history and church doctrine policy. And that is essentially the CS letter. It was sent, I believe to the CS director, but it, there was no response. And then it went viral on, you know, online and um, now you can get it either on PDF form or as a book. And there's lots of people who have read the CS letter who have gone through a faith crisis and left the church. I imagine it's probably in the tens of thousands. And then there's been a few people who have written responses. Yours is around, was it 350 to 400 pages? Uh, 400, it was a lot. Like, oh, it's long. It was it's pretty long. long. Sorry uh, about that. No, you're, <laughs> you're grand. Um, so you said at the start of your response, and I took down these bullet points, overall you feel, um, and let me know if this is a misrepresentation, that the CS letter is poorly researched and isn't great scholarship. And you feel that Jeremy hasn't always read the sources or his citations that he cites. Uh, and, and you also feel that you can confront all of these issues without hurting one's testimony. Would that, would that be yeah. accurate? That would be accurate. And, and, and that one part, I, so so Jeremy wrote a version of it that I responded to, and then he radically revised it. Yes. And so the version that's now online, both versions are online, but the one that most people are reading is the most recent one. Uh, and yeah. When I went through the second time and rewrote it, I'm, over 50% of it is new material right. uh, in the second version of my reply. Uh, but the thing that really jumped out at me when I was replying the second time, even more than the first time, was 
how often Jeremy is just passing on an argument that somebody else has made and he hasn't even read it. He hasn't even read his own source materials. Yeah. And when he changes his argument to some degree, um, he doesn't change the footnotes. You know, he, he talks about something and then he puts a footnote that was in the original CES letter that leads to a source that says something completely different from the point Jeremy's making. And the more I got into that, the more I thought, you, you're not even reading your own source material. You're passing on an unexamined argument that isn't saying what you say it's saying. Mm. And uh, that frustrated me a lot the second time around, more than the first. I didn't notice that as much the first time around as I did the second. Right. And and that's similar to a discussion I had with uh, David Snell on Saints Unscripted. Um, and, and we talked about when you're diving into these issues, how important it is to do your homework and to check, to fact check things and to not just take people's word for it. Because right. there's things which, even though I'm in the church and a believer, there's things I have unintentionally gotten wrong or realized that there's more surrounding this issue than what I was aware of. And it's very important to do your homework and be careful in this and perhaps intentionally, or I, I would like to think unintentionally, maybe some critics um, or, or Jeremy in this example, maybe haven't always checked their sources thoroughly, which is something that's important. Now, whenever I read through your CS letter response, I'm going to be honest. Uh, and I think you've got maybe some feedback. Um, some of it, I think you bring up some fair, set fair points and we're going to dive into that. At times when I read it, it, there does seem to be a lot of ad hominem or some ad hominem. There's times where it seems a bit snarky towards Jeremy, very defensive. And I even showed it to a family member because, you know, a certain segment, because to me, it seemed very, uh, defensive and almost, you know, that there was like a bit of bad blood. And I was like, how do you read this? And, and they thought you almost came across annoyed or irritated with them. Uh, I don't know if that was your intention writing it. What would be your response to people who feel that, you know, you're maybe just poking fun back or, or attacking Jeremy? Um, well, I've got two kinds of responses to that. The first is uh, there is no ad hominem in this, in my reply. And, and, and you, you, you can push back at me on, on that, but I define ad hominem as an actual attack on the person to the man is what ad hominem means. Mm -hmm. at no point do I attack Jeremy Runnels personally. At no point do I say, um, you know, you're a jerk or you're this, I, I mean, uh, so, 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 and, and every time somebody has said to me, Oh, your, your thing is nothing but ad hominem against Jeremy Runnels. I say, could you please show me a passage where I attack Jeremy Runnels because I'd be more than happy to take it out. I even said mm -hmm. that to Jeremy when I, when I first had sort of the exchange with Jeremy. Um, so I, 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 and, and I stand by that. I mean, it's been out now for five, six years and nobody's been able to really highlight a passage where I go after Jeremy Runnels as a human being mm. that said uh, your number two, your criticism that it is snarky, that it is sarcastic, uh, and that I do get annoyed with Jeremy Runnels's arguments. Uh, that is entirely a justified criticism. Uh, that's entirely true. Uh, and I regret that to some degree. Uh, I, and I, I came to regret that most when, um, the Midnight Mormons started making those. Uh, do, you, do you remember that they, they, yeah. they did a bunch of videos about the CES letter? Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. Uh, this is the show was the name of the show. T-I-T-S. You know, it's like <laughs> their Mormon is paying for a show called Tits. It's like, okay, <laughs> great. Uh, but that was so over the top snarky and really did go after Jeremy personally. It does. And they, and they kept quoting me, right? That's, that's something I noticed whenever I went through your CS letter response. I realized like these are a lot of the arguments that they were making on their videos. So they were using a lot of your material. They were using a lot of me. And, and so I went, sheesh, the fact that I'm able to fuel this kind of snarky, nasty video 
demonstrates that I went too far in terms of the amount of snark that I used in in my reply. Uh, but I, I stand by the fact that all of the snark is aimed at the arguments. It's right. not aimed at the person. Uh, you know, I, I think Jeremy makes some really, really stupid arguments in the CES letter. And I think it's fair game uh, to attack an argument and yeah. to be snarky and nasty about an argument as long as you're not attacking the person. I agree. Uh, and, and and when I met the Midnight Mormons, and I talked about this with RFM, there's, there's a segment the Midnight Mormons have yet to release uh, where we talked about uh, their show, and I talked about the fact that, look, attacking Jeremy Runnels does not diffuse the weight of his arguments. Exactly. And and Quaku's response to that was, that's like saying, well, if I get rid of this guy from Al-Qaeda, some other guy from Al-Qaeda will just take his place. And I said, no, 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 that's not, that's ridiculous. That's a terrible, terrible argument. Uh, it, it's, the, the issue is not, if you have to say, well, the reason the CES letter is bad is because Jeremy Runnels is a bank robber or something jeremy runnels is not trying to profit off it find some kind of wild example that doesn't that doesn't uh, actually besmirch jeremy runnels i think jeremy runnels is an honorable good guy i really like jeremy yeah Uh, that's good uh, but um and i i agree with that because i feel like whether or not his motives are sincere i like to give people the benefit of the doubt um and as i'm doing my videos I don't like it get becoming like a political thing or which side are you on or critics versus apologists. I'm more interested in the arguments and the evidence. Right. Um, want to try to come to truth. And I feel that if people can attack the person, uh, because whenever I, I listen to the, this is the show videos, I almost find it a bit like propaganda. And in, in that way that they made Jeremy Runnels and the CS letter sound ridiculous and stupid. And it was all nonsense. And it was, it was influencing people. And I, I, whenever I was listening to the videos, I kind of felt like they either weren't fully confronting the issues themselves right. and they're detracting from, from trying to attack him and discredit yeah. him. I think that comes more from a place of weakness. I agree. There should be no reason to attack the person. You should just talk about their, their arguments. Um, and yes, I was a bit disappointed by the this is the show videos because I was really I knew it was coming and I was really looking forward to it because I'm somebody who has a lot of the same questions or concerns or doubts that Jeremy brings up in the CS letter. And for someone like me who is in the church but has been through a faith crisis, I find it extremely belittling and disappointing. And I've also had friends and family members who have left over the similar issues. Um, so I think it's important to, you know, if it's not a good argument, let's let's talk about why it's not a good argument. Um, and then let's just, you know, talk about the issue in a fair and also I think in a kind and loving way, because right. there's some people's concerns and questions they might have, which to one person may not seem like that's not a big deal, but different things bother different people. You know, Jeremy, he harps on about the stone in the hat. To me, yeah. that wasn't a huge part of my faith crisis, but I had a family member who couldn't accept Joe Smith used a seer stone. That was like a shelf breaking moment, but we all interpret things differently. Could you talk a little about your experience in meeting Jeremy? And sure. Before you met him, um, because I think people can, when they read something, you know, I told you that my family member thought that you almost seemed like you were annoyed with him, like you were shouting as you were writing it. And people can... <laughs> They can obviously interpret how somebody writes things wrong. That's why I think it's bad to have an argument or a debate over writing or text. You know, it's better to have it in person. But did you feel any irritation or any frustration towards Jeremy because a lot of people had left the church when you were writing your reply? And then contrast how you feel towards him when you when you met him in person. Uh, no, um, I, I, I didn't. I honestly didn't think of Jeremy personally much when I was writing the reply, at least the first time. The second time around, I, I, 
I mean, I had seen his response to my reply and, or, or how he would respond to my reply. And so I, I, he, he was more of a human being the second time than he was the first time. But no, I, I, I really didn't feel any sort of irritation with him personally. Uh, I did find, I was irritated with some of his arguments. Right. Uh, I don't think I was screaming at my computer while I was <laughs> typing. Uh, but, um, but I, I, I can be sarcastic. I can be snarky. That's kind of the world in which I live. And I like to think that I'm good natured about it. But uh, I, if I were to go through my 400 pages again and rewrite it, which I every now and then think I want to do and then think, oh, it's just going to take so much time. And I'm just, mm. uh, you know. And, and so do you feel as well, it. like if, if Jeremy can dish it out, he should be able to take it as well? Like, did you feel like well, he was yeah. well, I mean, well, flippant the... in his CS ladder? Well, one of the things that I uh, that, that came around the second time I, I revised the reply is that Jeremy had been dishing it out quite a bit. You know, Jeremy was posting memes of Daniel Peterson in front of a flock of zombies, you know, <laughs> because he was misinterpreting a statement Daniel Peterson had said about uh, the zombie-like nature of the Spalding theory for the Book of Mormon. He says, this just keeps coming back. It's like a zombie. It just keeps coming back. And Jeremy interpreted that to mean he's calling me a zombie, me, Jeremy Reynolds. And he wasn't, but then, so Jeremy does all this ad hominem snarky stuff back to everybody. So, yeah, I mean, and, and we've talked, Jeremy and I have talked about that. His hands aren't, aren't clean in that regard either. Yeah. But I, but, but he actually has gone through the CES letter to try to uh, tone down the ad hominem and tone down the snark, the version that exists now online, his CES letter is considerably less snarky and tonally uh, nasty uh, than the first one was. So that's good. But uh, no. So what happened was I went on Bill Reel's podcast, which, I, which kind of, I sort of stumbled into somebody, some, I mean, I didn't even know who Bill Reel was. Uh, somebody online said, look, I'd love to see you go toe to toe with Bill Reel. And I said, no, I don't, I don't want to go toe to toe with anybody. I don't want, I don't want to debate anybody. I yeah. don't think debates. Uh, I, I, They're I just, entertaining, I don't, but they don't usually I don't have any change interest people's in that. minds. I I, they, well, they don't change people's minds. And, and I, I just don't have any interest in that. And I said, but I'm happy to talk to anybody. Yeah. And, and that's really I, I, we keep operating in the church. This is this isn't quite the answer to your question. This is a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's important. We keep operating in the church as if we have a choice as to whether or not we can engage our critics. We have a choice as to whether or not we can read information that is critical of the church, or uh, that 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 we can just so silo that off and just pretend it doesn't exist. I think that was sort of possible maybe when I was a missionary in the eighties, it's not possible now in the age of the internet. Uh, you know, all of the kinds of arguments against the church uh, that I encountered in the eighties came from ministers who found out that their flock were meeting with the Mormons and they gave these little pamphlets to them in brown paper bags. And now yeah. my children can get online and they type in the word Mormon and up comes the Adam God theory, or up comes Joseph Smith's polygamy, or up comes all of the things that that and, and we cannot and we can't pretend otherwise. I just feel like we have no choice but to talk to people and to engage. It's so and much so more I, accessible. There's so many more people who are encountering, uh, you know, things which are critical of the church. Talking yeah, is truth claims in church history. It's something that I think needs to be confronted. I think. The church um, has probably been pressured and they're they're trying to be more forthright. You know, they've released the gospel topics essays, the science volumes, the Joseph Smith's papers project. Right. They even have a gospel talk topic section where they, they have one on the Kinderhood plates, the 1826 glass liquor trial. So they're they're trying to be more open with its history. Um, right. obviously they're always gonna have a faithful interpretation but of course of course they will but it's good that they're trying to be more open and transparent maybe some critics feel they're not 
as fully transparent as they would want them to be. Uh, but you're right. Like we, we can't bury our head in the sand. We can't just put things on a shelf and just forget about it. You know, these things are becoming more and more prominent and they have to be sort of confronted. And that's what I admire about you, what you're doing. Um, that's something that I'm striving to do as well with me starting my channel. Um, is there anything else you want to say before we talk? about before we well, go into the CS ladder maybe talk about just Jeremy briefly and what it was like meeting sure him. sure yeah I, I I I took a tangent but I want to get back to how I met Jeremy yeah um so so Bill Real uh, I, I this guy says go toe to toe with Bill Real and I said I'll talk to anybody and Bill Real called me uh within minutes of that I don't know how he got my number but he found me and called me and said I'd love to have you on my podcast and I went okay and uh when know, was I this 2019 2020 this is earlier than that this oh, okay. this was this was 20 gosh i don't know because i know he got excommunicated i think it was around november december 2018 because that's whenever i first sort of went down the rabbit hole and went through a faith crisis you know i think it was 2019 now okay. that i'm thinking about it i because um because i think i was already that's when I started in the choir and I think I was already in choir school <laughs> when Bill Reed called me. Um, it's probably quite difficult to get on to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. You must be a good singer. Oh, uh, well, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's quite a process. Uh, it's also just sheer joy from beginning to end. Yeah. And it's all the great stuff in the church without any of the bad stuff. Uh, you, you know, you're in the choir, it, it gets you out of every other calling. Uh, <laughs> it, it's your church calling. So my church calling is I have to go every week and have a worldwide concert where I get to sing beautiful music with music professionals. I mean, it's just, it's that just sounds like such a burden. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, it's people talk about oh, the sacrifice you make to be in the choir. I'm like, what are you talking about? This is the greatest gig. This is, I mean, try being a second counselor in a bishopric. That's a lot harder. Um, anyway, um yeah so i went on bill real we had all this the stuff and I, I was frustrated with the bill real podcast only because i really enjoyed the conversation we had and it went on much longer than i thought it would i thought i was going on for like two hours and then we kept saying okay we'll come back come back and we ended up doing 14 15 hours i mean we we, we just kept and he released all six episodes on the same day and then right after that went online and said look how i won my debate with jim bennett oh. and that made me furious uh because it wasn't a debate i mean so every time i would say to bill real oh no i understand why you would feel that way and no your your point of view is legitimate he took that as aha look at how much ground jim bennett has given up yeah you know, mine's the stronger he, argument yeah, mine's a stronger argument because Jim Bennett was willing to say that I have a legitimate point of view. And 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 that made me furious because I think that makes it harder for anybody to have those kinds of conversations again. Yeah. And we did this series of episodes and then we did an episode afterwards where we talked about the aftermath of the release. And if you listen to that, I'm a whole lot testier with Bill Real than I was in the first six. I'll have to watch that. And I, I don't know if I've watched all six. I watched definitely a few of them. They're not video, they're only audio. We didn't do a video thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, in fact, I can remember recording one with my microphone next to me while I was lying in bed. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so, so but that's neither here nor there. The point is that after that, I got an email from Jeremy Runnels. And Jeremy said, oh, you made such a fool of yourself on the Bill Real podcast. Oh, man, you gave me all the rope I need to hang you with. Uh, you know, you're just an embarrassment. And, oh, it was so much fun to see you. I mean, it, it was really nasty. And and I wrote back and I, and I, you know, I was nasty to him back. And we went back and forth. And, and at one point I said, you realize no one else is reading this, right? it's just me you know we're not we're not doing some kind of performative thing on the internet where people can so we don't need to be this snarky and and then finally i said look <laughs> this be more wouldn't this be more fun over burgers i'm buying 
And that completely disarmed him. It was like, uh, okay, sure. So we went to Cubby's in Lehigh. Uh, which you're on the other side of the pond, so you wouldn't know what that is. But it's a nice burger place in uh, in northern Utah County. And we sat for we we had lunch, and uh, you know we it was a little bit icy at the beginning, and then finally he said, "All right, now tell me why you went after me." And I laughed, and that just sort of broke the ice, and we just started <laughs> talking. Yeah, and uh, we were there for about three hours, and we could have gone on all day if oh, I if bet. We didn't have other things we had to do. But uh, I got to know Jeremy. He's from a similar part of Southern California as I am. We had kind of similar backgrounds. Uh, I think he's a great guy. Uh, I still don't agree with him, and I still think there are a lot of things in the CES letter that are pretty stupid. But but Jeremy Runnels is a great guy, and I think Jeremy Runnels uh, came to his position uh, from a place of integrity. You know, yeah. he, he confronted these issues and felt that he had to leave the church as a result. And I confronted the same issues and didn't feel like I had to leave the church. And in fact, felt like, uh, you know, my testimony was stronger at the end of it. And uh, and I think there's nothing wrong with saying those are both legitimate points of view. Yeah, and people can that, draw different interpretations and come to their own conclusions based right. upon, you know, their experiences and how they interpret things and like we said earlier what is a big issue to one may not be as big to another and I, I resonate with Jeremy because I've had a bit of a faith journey I, I did leave the church at one point and I felt like I left out of integrity and I came back due to experiences in my life and I felt it was also integrity that that brought me back so I can understand sort of both of your decisions in those regards, I think for a lot of people, and I think it was probably the same for Jeremy, there's a lot of people that can feel betrayed. They can feel a bit duped. They could feel right. like this is not the church narrative of church history of Joseph Smith that I knew about growing up. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of any of these things. And it just seems so damaging. And there's a lot of people who just don't know how to reconcile all of the, the problems or the issues or the messiness with their the sort of whitewash very faith promoting simplistic view they had of the gospel and and church history and i think right. that's that's a hard thing is that betrayal that a lot of people feel yep i mean and that's exactly how i felt uh with my faith crisis as a 18 year old kid yeah uh, but no but that's that's exactly right yeah and, and well, and one of the interesting things from this and, and getting to know Jeremy and one of the interesting experiences that I did not anticipate when I wrote this, I still get very kind messages from people who read the CES letter reply and uh, feel like it helped them to stay in the church or it helped them to, to save their faith. Um, a lot of them come from missionaries. I found out that some mission presidents have actually assigned all their missionaries to read my reply. Wow. Uh, which, which is really kind of very humbling. I think that's really kind of nice. And I get a lot of those messages. But I now, after going on Bill Reel, after going on John DeLynn particularly, and after actively engaging with people outside the church, people who've left the church, I get just as many, if not more, messages uh, from people outside the church who say, you did not convince me to come back to church. I, But what you did convince me is that it's possible to be in the church and be a person of integrity and you've helped yeah. me you've helped me to be able to um better understand and appreciate and deal with my family and friends who are still in the church yeah and and, and i take that as a huge huge win and uh, you know so so that's kind of those are kind of been the waters that i've been swimming in uh more recently. So, I mean, you asked me at the beginning, if I consider myself an apologist, I really, really don't because I think that um, the only way to be able to have a sustainable faith is to be able to admit and accept the possibility that the church has been wrong. 
in in a number of different cases. If you can't do, I, I see apologists as people who who are un, unwilling or, or or feel compelled to demonstrate that the church has never been wrong. Yeah, the church is never in the wrong. Defend the church of Joseph Smith at all Defend costs, the church even if at it all is costs. a rational and, argument. And I don't think actually that that really d- does Joseph Smith or the church any favors, because when you have to when you have to contort your faith into a way that makes the church infallible and makes Joseph Smith or any of these people infallible, um, you you are not equipped to deal with some of really truly terrible things I mean, yeah. how do you deal with the mountain meadows massacre if you if you think that the church has never been wrong uh how do you how do you deal with uh, brigham young's terrible terrible racist statements about killing interracial couples on the spot you know i mean you you have to be able to say no that was wrong yeah if you want to be able to uh to have your that that has to be a possibility uh the reason why i think people like jeremy and others can't stay in the church is that the church has to be infallible the church has to be perfect in order for it to be true and the church isn't perfect the church isn't infallible and so therefore the church has to be not true i mean that that kind of black and white thinking yeah uh of necessity drives people out of the church. If you can't give up the black and white thinking, then you can't stay in the church when you encounter real and powerful errors and mistakes and, and problems. That, that definitely uh, would have been my, my view, my testimony it would have been black and white. It's all hundred percent true and perfect. Everything a prophet says, everything that's in the scriptures. And um, I would have felt like I had a really sure testimony, like, I would have been able to say I I 100% know had so many spiritual convictions and confirmations both intellectually spiritually and I agree with you that I I could not go back to that black and white thinking when you know that there for example there's been prophets who have said or taught things which are wrong doctrinally right. morally right. um you know that don't harmonize with doctrine or with your ethics and you can't go back to that simplistic um prophets are always right they'll always teach the truth they'll never lead you astray um and that there is that but that can cause people to then just leave you know there's no way they can reconcile it and there can be that gray for those who are more nuanced for those who still can find ways to have faith who still believe in the truth claims while acknowledging all this messiness all this complexity all this confusion uh, and I think that's what we're going to dive into and discuss. All right, let's more. dive. Let's go. So the first part of, the, of his CS letter, he talks about the Book of Mormon. You know, the Book of Mormon, it's book of scripture, another testament of Jesus Christ. It is considered to be the keystone of our religion. Um, you know, it, it is the tangible evidence of Joseph Smith as a prophet, him translating the gold plates by the gift and power of God delivered to him by an angel so it is it is foundational so if the book of mormon can be impeached if it can be discredited if it can be disproven as that this came from joseph smith it's a 19th century production then really the church's truth claims they they rise or fall with the book of mormon so we'll start with um his criticism surrounding the book of mormon so some of these questions i'm just getting directly from the cs letter some of them i'm maybe paraphrasing okay the first thing he brings up is what are 1769 King James Version errors or variations? What are they doing in the text of the Book of Mormon that are unique to the 1769 version which Joseph Smith had? So he's he's essentially saying, you know, if, if it was translated by the gift and power of God, why should there be any errors that come from the King James Bible translators? You know, why would there be errors in it? And isn't that convenient? That's the same Bible that Joseph Smith had. Could you talk about your response to that? Sure. Uh, I think Jeremy's arguments against the Book of Mormon are easily the weakest part of the CES letter, by far. Uh, I think the case for the Book of Mormon is far stronger than the critics are willing to allow. And the Book of Mormon is really the linchpin of my faith. 
uh, whenever I get frustrated with the church, when I get frustrated with anything else, uh, I can't get around the Book of Mormon. Hmm. You know, Jeff Holland talked about the idea that you have to go around over or under the Book of Mormon to get out of this church. And I've not, I've not been able to do that. I, I have yet to find a persuasive secular explanation for its existence that doesn't sound as miraculous or more miraculous than gold plates and an angel. Okay, so that's just a broad overview. Uh, so not only do I think Jeremy's arguments about the Book of Mormon are his weakest, but I think this is his weakest Book of Mormon argument uh, because it it it's woefully ignorant of what translation is and how translation works. Uh, Jeremy seems to be operating under the assumption that you can take a word in a language and just sort of one for one take that word and put that word into another language, and then you have something similar. Uh, that doesn't work. And I demonstrate that yeah. in my reply. It's the reason you can't take the English version of the Book of Mormon, slap it into Google Translate and write Russian, and then get a Russian version of the Book of Mormon that is coherent. It's not going to be word for word. I mean, word, it, it doesn't work because you're talking about idiomatic expressions. You're talking about all kinds of uh, I mean, different ways that different words are used. Uh, so, so he's coming at it with an expectation and with an assumption that is fundamentally incorrect, that there should be sort of this one-to-one -one relationship between words. Now, with regard to the King James language that's in the Book of Mormon, uh, it's interesting because you you did this differently when you introduced the question. You said errors or variations. Um, I think, I think initial... Jeremy changed his CS ladder to variation. I think that's why I The reason that he in. did that is because the link, the uh, I, I, th this is really inside baseball, but the link that he, he, uh, he used to link to was a Wikipedia article that talked about errors in the 1769 version of the book of more of the of the king james bible but they aren't errors they are variations they right. use different words and for them to be errors they would have to be words that did not accurately reflect the ancient text they do accurately reflect the ancient text in its original language they just use different english words to do it am so i right in thinking that's to make it more readable and understandable well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, and I and I have to go into the weeds again and figure out what examples he used. Uh, but uh, they're perfectly valid uh, uh, different variations. The better question that Jeremy ought to have been asking and that most scholars do ask is why is there King James language in the Book of Mormon at all? Because the likelihood of Joseph Smith as a translator, choosing those exact same words is next to nothing. I mean, it's very clear that he's choosing to use the King James language uh, to represent the ancient text. Yeah, and I mean, it's the reason why you have the Good News Bible and the you know a New World Translation of the Bible and the you know there are so many different translations of the Bible. None of them use precisely the same text. Uh, so it's very clear that Joseph Smith is using specifically the King James version of the text. Um, so, so, so that's that is the more legitimate question, and it's one that Jeremy just kind of ignores or doesn't really understand. And uh, I think the answer to that question, Hugh Nibley answered that question better than anybody did. He talks about when the angel Gabriel appeared to uh, Mary. He quoted the Old Testament in the language and version that Mary was most familiar with. Mm. And so there, there's no reason to think that if Joseph Smith is receiving this translation, he, he isn't translating it in the way a traditional translator would uh, because he doesn't know the ancient language. He re he's receiving the translation as revelation. Uh, so there's no reason to to doubt that the way that he would receive that revelation would be in the translation he both knew and understood. Yeah. Uh, I, and, I know some apologists would say, depending on whether you lean more towards a tight translation where he's reading it 
word for word from the stone or a loose translation where it's more inspiration and revelation through his mind um yeah if you believe it was a tight translation then i suppose the the interpretation would be that god revealed it to him in 19th century king, king james bible language right um, and that you know god can speak to us according to our language our understanding or if a loose translation I, i'd like to get your thoughts on which you lean towards more than it's joseph clothing i think you you say this as well in your csla response sort of this uh ancient concepts or language into 19th century english yeah uh i lean more in that direction um loose I, over I, tight no uh, loose over tight uh there, there are clearly some moments that were absolutely tight in, in that, you know, names. Joseph Smith would have to stop and sort of spell out a name uh, that that uh, that he didn't know or recognize. Um, I mean, the whole issue of the stone and the hat, the idea that the words magically appeared to him and he couldn't move on unless the words were perfect. Uh, we only get that from David Whitmer um, decades after the fact, decades after Joseph Smith was dead. I don't think David Whitmer was lying per se, but uh, I, I think that the only contemporaneous document we have that describes what was happening in the translation is the eighth section of the Doctrine and Covenants that we quote out of context a lot about the idea of a burning in the bosom that you know something is right, you have to study it out in your mind. Uh, that that revelation seems to make clear to me that whatever was happening required effort on Joseph's part, that he was actively engaged somehow in that process. Uh, and, and people who have studied the actual manuscript, Richard Bushman talks about the, the fact that they, the manuscript seemed to come in about 20 words at a time. And then they would stop uh, and names were spelled out one letter at a time. If you examine the document, it seems to favor that kind of kind of a, an understanding of how that document was produced. Uh, but so so that that would suggest to me that Joseph, however that worked, Joseph was not a passive participant. And, and a, a fully tight translation makes him a newsreader. Uh and not really a translator in any kind of respect. It just he's just reading it, and mm. uh, and I, I I think he was an active participant in it. And I, I I can't define that. I can't put the boundaries on that. Uh, I wish we had more information about that. Uh, but uh, what's fascinating is that 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 applies to the Isaiah sections that are just huge mass portions of the King James Bible that appear in the Book of Mormon. A much easier way to do that would be to take down the King James Bible, take down the paper, and just start, you know, copying it. Uh, but it's very clear, particularly from some of the errors, uh, one of which Jeremy cites, the idea of, of the sea versus the Red Sea. Yeah, I remember that one. Uh, uh, it's very clear, then, that Joseph Smith is reading this to Oliver Cowdery, uh, and that that it's not just somebody just copying. Uh, you wouldn't have those kind of errors if you're just copying the letter. And also, over 50% of the verses have slight variations in them, which again wouldn't happen. Most of them aren't of any major significance, but but that suggests he's getting this information somewhere from just copying it out of the pages of a Bible. Uh, so... Um, I mean, tight versus loose, at this point, it, it, it seems very clear that Joseph Smith uh, felt like the kind of King James English that we see throughout the Book of Mormon was sort of the language of God. The, the, I mean, that's, that's how you speak with God. It's interesting to me that this lingers now, that we pray with these and thous in King James English in English. Because even the Doctrine and Covenants is in King James language as well. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't think we need to do that personally. I've mm -hmm. kind of given up doing that. I still pray with these and thous in church because I don't want people to think I'm some kind of freak. 
<laughs> but but in my own personal prayers, my prayers are more conversational. They're more like um, Tevia from Fiddler on the Roof, just looking up to the sky and having a conversation with God. I I, I find that to be uh, more uh, appropriate in my own personal life. Yeah, but but it's uh, more less formal as well. It wasn't until I started going to Christian churches that I realized that we're probably one of the only few churches that pray in King James, you know, yeah, English, yeah. these and those. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's necessary personally, but, but, but the point is just to bring all this home. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the idea that uh, there's King James English in the Bible demonstrates, I think, Joseph Smith's weaknesses and Joseph Smith's understanding of that's how God is supposed to talk. And so I think that's how God spoke to him because it was more familiar to him that, that he used the translation with which Joseph Smith would have been most familiar. Hmm. And that seems to me to be entirely appropriate. I don't think it's a very compelling argument against the Book of Mormon at all. What, what do you think of those uh, passages? Um, I don't know them word for it, but there's you know, pastors in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants where the Lord makes it seem like these are my words. These, you know, these are not the words of Joseph Smith. These are the, the words of the Lord and that Joseph is the translator. And some apologists would lean more towards the Lord seems to be indicating that it is a more tight translation versus loose. And I had one apologetic friend tell me that DNC 8 or was it DNC 9 that says, you know, you must study it out in your mind then ask me if it'd be right, you know, when Oliver Cardrey failed. He pointed out to me that Oliver didn't try using the stone. He tried using, you know, the divining rod. So maybe Joseph Smith didn't do it the same method as that. Don't want to spend too long on this point, but any any thoughts on that? Like scripture saying that these are the words, you know, words of the Lord, not the words of Joseph mingled with, you know, inspiration. Right. Well, I, I, I don't think there is any, there are any words of the Lord uh, that don't come through a human conduit and therefore aren't um, limited by human weakness and human frailty. Okay. Uh, in the same verse, in the same section, well, in the first section of the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, uh, the Lord speaking through Joseph Smith talks about speaking to them in their weakness, according to their language, that they may come to understanding. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that was the verse Paul Dunn used, um, Quoting Paul Dunn is probably terrible to do because Paul Dunn is discredited, <laughs> but he talks about the guy who went to the University of Southern California, which is the same place I went. Paul Dunn was an institute director there, and this guy was a member of the church, and he was in an English class, and the English professor says, uh, found out he was a member of the church, and he says, so does the Mormon God speak all kinds of different languages? Does he... and and the student said, well, sure, of course he does. He says, so, so he speaks English. Well, yes. Does he speak better English than I do? And this student, he says, now remember, I'm a, I'm a professor of English at a prestigious university, and I've studied this. Does, does your God speak better English than I do? And this student said, well, yes, I may get in trouble for this, but I'd say that God speaks better English than you do. And this professor then says, well, then why doesn't he? And he takes out a copy of the Book of Mormon that's been marked with all of these grammatical errors. Mm. And uh, this student goes back to Paul Dunn and says, well, I lost my testimony today in English class. And Paul Dunn referred to the first section of the Doctrine and Covenants, that, that I speak unto my servants in their weakness according to their language. Yeah. Joseph Smith the language of the Book of Mormon is not particularly sophisticated. It's King James English. There's these and thys, but there's also words like stiff neckedness, which you know isn't a word. Joseph Smith sort of made it up. Uh, it, it it's in it's written in Joseph Smith's vocabulary, and at the time, Joseph Smith did not have a particularly extensive vocabulary. Joseph Smith's vocabulary got far more sophisticated as he got older. Mm. But, um, but so, you know, we talk about the priesthood as the power to act in the name of God. 
And we, when we pray, we say we are praying in the name of Jesus Christ. We invoke all of this. Uh, if, if we're acting in the name of God, then we're doing what God would do if he were there. And yet we're doing what a human being can do. We are not doing, uh, you know, we, are, we still are not God. And so the fact that God would say, these are my words, uh, is entirely consistent with how God interacts with the people who have the keys to act in his name. Mm. Uh, he validates, he supports, he sustains the weakness of his servants who are speaking on his behalf. It does not mean that, that, that what, what happens is pure and perfect without any kind of human error or human influence. The Book of Mormon, and, and, I, and this is one of the arguments I make in my reply to Jeremy, Book of Mormon on its title page admits that there are mistakes in it. That's right. That there, that there be mistakes, that, you know, if there be error, they, they are the mistakes of men. Yeah, condemn not the things of God. Right, right, because of the imperfections in this record. Uh, you know, th th that's all throughout the Book of Mormon. There are those kinds of admissions. We uh, do would not you say, sorry, sorry, would you say that this um, very literalistic, fundamentalist view of scripture, I know I would have had that, I would have, I probably would say that I've been taught to have this belief, so I don't think it was just me, that it is completely the word of God. Um, and then when you find out, when you dive into church history, that maybe revelations have been revised or altered, or uh, there's been a couple of wee changes more than grammar to the Book of Mormon. That caused me to think, how could they justify changing God's words? Now you're saying that you don't believe that revelation works that way, and that perhaps it was our assumptions or expectations that were perhaps not not accurate or as realistic that it's always closed through a human vessel right well and, and i hate to quote dan brown the author of the da vinci code but in the da vinci code uh, one of the characters says the bible did not arrive by facts from heaven and and i think people think of revelation as joseph smith stands there and a teletype of words appears before his eyes and and that's how the revelation comes. I mean, I I I talk about, and I talked about this a little bit with RFM in in our interview a couple of days ago. Um, my experience with revelation. I talk about a personal revelation that I received when I was wrestling with the policy of exclusion from 2015, when gay children of gay people could not be baptized. Yeah, I was pretty much on my way out of the church. I, I was so frustrated with something that I knew to be wrong. And I thought, how can I stay? And I, you know, I can count on one hand the times where I feel I've received genuine personal revelation. Uh, but I, I feel that on that occasion I did. And the revelation, uh, if I were to clothe it in language, would be, be patient. It will all work out in the end. Those are the words I use when I describe this revelation. I also describe, please don't leave the church. This is where I've put you. This is where you can do the most good. Uh, those words never, ever appeared to me in any, I did not hear those words. I did not see those words. But what I felt was what Joseph Smith describes as pure intelligence flowing into you. And the amount of time I've taken to describe all this um, is far less than the amount of time it took me to know all this. This happened in an instant. One instant I knew it, didn't know it. One instant I did. And, and included in that pure intelligence was also a feeling of love, of pure love, of acceptance, of, of understanding. I'm, all of these things, uh, it's too big for words to contain. And if that was the experience Joseph Smith had when he received revelation, and I believe it is, I believe that's the experience people have when they receive genuine revelation from the Lord. Uh, it becomes Joseph's responsibility to somehow capture something that huge and put it in a box of language. Uh, and that's difficult to do. And so the fact that Joseph went back and would revise or, or, or do all of that 
uh, doesn't trouble me in the least uh, because the words themselves are not the revelation. The words are a description of the revelation. And to fully understand revelation, you have to, I believe, uh, have access to the same spirit that provided that revelation. Uh, we hear that all the time from, from prophets. Uh, the, uh, the Holy Ghost, Joseph Smith says, no man can receive the Holy Ghost without receiving revelation. The Holy Ghost uh, is a revelator. And, and, you know, even when you're sitting in church and someone bears a testimony and it touches you and you feel the spirit, there's a revelation there. Uh, there's information. There's a con the confirmation includes information. Mm. So it does not disturb me at all to know that Joseph re revised his revelations. The revisions to the Book of Mormon, uh, it's fascinating because the overwhelming majority of them are grammatical, and it's because the initial text included no punctuation. The Book of Mormon was first punctuated by E.B. Grandin, the printer, who was not a member of the church. So I don't know that we ought to believe that he was receiving revelation as to where he should put periods and commas. Uh, but uh, the the revisions Joseph Smith made, uh, and, and Jeremy brings them up in the CES letter, the most significant revisions are where he talks about you know, the, the Trinitarian revisions. Yeah. Behold Mary, the mother of God. Uh, behold Mary, the mother of the son of God. Joseph added that. I think he did that because he was concerned it sounded too Catholic. Uh, to clarify it. To clarify it. Uh, neither, neither one of those versions of it is any more or less Trinitarian than the other. Um, I, I you know, so, but, and I and I could get into that in length in the reply too, but that doesn't really concern me all that much. The one revision I'm very grateful for is that Joseph later revised the part of white and delightsome to pure and delightsome, uh, making it clear that white and delightsome was not necessarily a reference to skin color so much as uh, purity. Mm. You know, you know, blackness can also mean darkness, and not necessarily. Uh, kind of like synonyms. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it, the, the whiteness is a metaphorical whiteness. It's a purity rather than a skin color. Is that uh, how you would interpret the Lamanites being cursed with a, a black curse in the Book of Mormon? Do you uh, a literal yeah. curse or more yeah. metaphorical? Uh, like, that it's a darkness? I mean, although hmm. the Book of Mormon... I mean, I think it does use the word skin of blackness. Which it, does, is, it does say skin of blackness. And, and so I think there's racism there. Uh, I don't know who, to whom to attribute the racism. Uh, I don't attribute it to God. I would attribute it to Joseph Smith or I would attribute it to the Nephites themselves uh, who, or, or to Nephi who may have made that kind of judgment. It's, it's interesting because when, when, when you start pointing out the racism in the Book of Mormon, uh, you focus on those verses and you don't focus on the totality of the work because the totality of the Book of Mormon is, it's a very complex analysis of race. And in fact, by the time you get to where the Lamanites are the only people left, Lamanite is no longer a racial designation. After Jesus comes in fourth Nephi, in third Nephi, in fourth Nephi, it tells us that there were no manner of ites that all the people were one Lamanites, Nephites, everybody, they've all intermarried. They've all. So, and then finally there are people who call themselves Lamanites uh, when, when that time of peace ends, but that's no longer, they're no longer direct descendants of Laman. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is no longer a racial designation. So it, it, you can't apply this. It does say the curse of God then follows them, but it doesn't, describe a sort of skin color happening when that happens it describes that they, they they have brought the curse on themselves because they're no longer following god so so you i would argue that the most um righteous prophet in the book of mormon the one that that jesus himself says you better include his writings here is samuel the lamanite 
you know, that that skin color, it, he's he's clearly a Lamanite when Lamanite is still a racial designation. Hmm. Uh, so to, to say that the Book of Mormon is racist is to ignore uh, the entire totality of the work and to ignore the condemnations of racism, specific condemnations of, you know, um, rail not against them because of the color of their skin. And of course, uh, Second Nephi, uh, is it 2230? All are alike unto God. He denieth none who come unto them, black and white, bond and free. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Book of Mormon is, it, it, the message of the Book of Mormon is that we need to reject racism. But I think the racism of Nephi or the racism of the translator made its way into Second Nephi chapter five. Yeah, and and as you were talking about revelation in scripture, I think for me personally, I would find scripture very problematic if every single word came directly from the mouth of God. You know, like God breathed, as um, you know, some Christians view the Bible. Um, right. As you talk about it, it, it almost seemed to me like they're they're recording their own revelations and experiences and there's some parts of the book of mormon which just seem more historical you know this happened in this year and this happened it doesn't seem overly right inspired like is this really the word of the lord or are they just recording what's going on and then they're writing themselves their own experiences and revelations with the divine right well, there's been really good um discussion so far on the book of mormon I have a few more questions to ask this one you might feel like you, we've already sort of touched on, but he talks about mistranslated Bible passages. This is one thing I noticed on my, on my mission. So I noticed there's a scripture where Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, there's many that will, you know, say, uh, you know, cast out demons in my name and do many wonderful works. And then I'll say to them, I never knew you. And I remember reading in the Joseph Smith translation, he changed it to you never knew me. And I right. interpreted that as, oh, he's, you know, the Bible has mistranslations. He's translated it into its correct version. And I preferred that translation. And then I remember I read in the Book of Mormon as a missionary and it's had the incorrect the translation word. in the Book of Mormon. I was like, huh, I was like, that's funny. You think it would have the correct translation, you know, if it came by the gift and power of God. And he, he cites different passages um where you know that's that's the case what would be your response to that well that goes a little bit with what i said previously which is the the revelation is not the words the words are the description of the revelation uh the example jeremy uses is where in the sermon on the mount um in in the joseph smith translation of the sermon on the mount when when uh, Jesus talks about take no thought for what you will eat or drink. You know, um, uh, Joe Smith translation makes that clear that he's aiming that directly at the apostles, that the apostles don't need to take any time. You know, you know, Peter needs to give up being a fisherman. They need to give up their livelihoods. Don't worry about it. Go out. Cause as you, as you do this, um, I'll take care of you. And, and the, but that's not necessarily a promise specifically to the entire world that we, you and I, who are not apostles, we got to figure out where our next meal is coming from. We've got to go get jobs. We've got to work. Um, not the apostles, not that apostles don't work, but they're not worried about any of that kind of thing. And what's interesting is that uh, Jeremy does that, but he adds uh, an ellipsis where he takes out the fact that uh, Jesus pulls the apostles aside in the Book of Mormon and then gives them the language that's in the non-Joseph Smith translation of the New Testament. And Jeremy's upset that the language is different. And I point out, well, yes, but look, the message is the same. You know, they're, they're, they're describing two different things and the same message that this is this is supposed to be aimed at the apostles. Uh, but he's using two different kinds of, of language to do that. And if the message is the same, it doesn't matter if the words aren't the same. Right. Now, with regard to I never knew you or you never knew me, I don't necessarily think that means uh, you never knew me is false doctrine. I think it means that at that point, Joseph Smith went, probably a better way to describe this is I never knew you. Now, was that actually the words that came out of Jesus's mouth at some point in 30, 
one common era, you know, that's a whole other discussion itself because yes, the, the discussion about was it a literal translation? Because whenever I've looked at sort of apologetics, they reframe Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible of more of a inspired revision or commentary. And I think I also have this note that you talk about, well, the Book of Mormon isn't inerrant. So that's why right. that could be in there as well. Anything else you want to add on to that? No, no, I think, uh, no, only to say that, that the Book of Mormon, the power and the strength of the Book of Mormon comes from its ability to serve as a divine access point. It's the phrase I use. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we can get into all of these weeds about it, but the reason why it endures and the church endures is that people have encounters with God when they read the Book of Mormon. And those encounters aren't necessarily, do you know who Greg Prince is? Yeah. Uh, Greg Prince, uh, I talked to Greg Prince about this. And he says, I'll ask people three questions when um, about the Book of Mormon uh, when they join the church. And I said, first is, did you read it all the way through? And usually the answer is no. He says, and well, okay, question two, what do you remember from what you read? And he gets answers like, well, well there were a lot of wars. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, what was your experience like when you read that book? Well, let me tell you. He says, then their eyes light up. And then the phrase he uses is something happens when people read that book that is not in that book. You know, it, that it's not the text itself. It's, it's that for whatever reason, that book serves as an access point, mm. serves as a, people encounter God when they read those read those pages and they receive revelation from God that is not confined to what's written in that book. And and so, so that's kind of where my testimony is. Yeah. It, it, so when you start arguing about, well, is it historical and how much is historical and how much, or you, or you start going, okay, start talking about Nahum and, and archeological evidence and everything else. It's like, I, I love those discussions. Those are fun. But the reason the Book of Mormon has transformed my life has very little to do with those discussions. And the yeah, reason why I'm not worried about the future of the church is that people who read the Book of Mormon continue to have that encounter with God. Yeah. And, and you know, whatever it is that's launching that encounter, whether it's a inspired fiction or whether it's Midrash or whether it's, you know, a word for word translation of a document on gold plates is really incidental to that process, to yeah. that divine connection. No, and I, I would agree that most people who gain a testimony of the church or the Book of Mormon or convert, it's primarily through a, a spiritual experience with the book, um, their own personal encounter with God, with revelation. That's what converts people. And that's sort of what the book tells us to do. You know, it's a right. spiritual way of coming to know it but at the same time it does make um historical claims as well it does claim right. that you know the the native american the one we talk about this next um are the um descendants of uh or the principal ancestors were the Leonites. Right. um right. and well i i would agree with you with that about the power of the book you know the, the spiritual connection and inspiration you can receive um, you know, Jeremy talks about and critics talk about that it has to be historically true. For, for me, I know some people might hold, you know, inspired fiction. I don't I don't believe you do. Um, I don't. I don't think that could work for me. Um, so I, yeah, he, I, I'm impressed by people who can maintain their faith and, and take that position. And I respect them. Yeah. And I think the church uh, church is big enough to accommodate them. And I wouldn't do anything to drive them out. Yeah, I don't. I don't personally understand how they do that. Yeah, no. For me, if there wasn't a literal Nephi, if there wasn't literal gold plates, um, I think and... there absolutely has to be a little literal Moroni. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you know, Joseph Smith made up a huge, huge story. That I mean, there there has to be a Moroni, or Joseph Smith was lying through his teeth. Yeah, and I don't think Joseph Smith was lying through his teeth or deluded 
So, so Jeremy says, you know, DNA analysis concludes Native Americans originate from Asia, not Israel, uh, and that the church changed its introduction to the Lamanites are the primary ancestors of the Native Americans to they are among the ancestors and that science pretty much forced this change and it calls into question the Book of Mormon's historicity. Um, what, what are some of your responses to DNA? It's a complicated one. I'm not a sure. scientist, so sometimes it goes over my head. Talk a little about your response to that. Um, my response to that is in line with the Gospel Topics essay, which was written by Ugo Perigo. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Yeah. Um, um, well, I want to back up a little bit because people scream about that change in that introduction as if somehow that's a change in Scripture. That introduction was not written by Joseph Smith or translated from by Joseph Smith or part of the gold plates or anything else. I think it was added in 1981. I could be wrong about that. Yeah, I have that in my notes. I think it was introduction changed. wasn't part of the, the scripture. I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't understand. I mean, that, that's like saying that all of our, our uh, manuals have to be infallible. Mm. You know, I mean, th this, this is not at no point uh, are, are we to presume that that that's part of the scriptural text. So the fact that it's changed doesn't bother me at all. And, and it changed because it, I think it more accurately reflects uh, our, the, the extent of our knowledge. It does not contradict the previous statement, however. It allows for a greater possibility. I mean, the previous statement is they are the principal ancestors. Well, if they are the principal ancestors, then they are also among the ancestors. So if it turns out that the original statement was correct, this new statement is still also correct. Uh, I think it's the church sort of covering its bases and hedging its bets a little bit because uh, because we don't understand the genetic makeup of of the Lamanites and all this kind of thing. So my understanding, you're not a scientist, I'm not a scientist. Uh, Ugo Perigo is a scientist. Um, and And what the scientists say is that the amount of information we can get about ancient people is extraordinarily limited, far more limited than the critics are you are using to expand mitochondrial DNA to exclude the possibility of Lehi's family settling on the continent. I think it does eliminate the possibility that Lehi and his family landed on an empty continent, which is, I think, a, what a lot of people believed for the vast majority of the church's history. Uh, I don't think the text can sustain that. And I think the actual Book of Mormon text um, uh, speaks against that in a number mm. of different ways. Is that like, um, um, was it Mulek and his people yeah. and the Jaredites being there before? Right. Um, I know some but, critics would, would cite a scripture. I think, I think I have it here in my notes. It talks about how I think this be kept is, from other nations. Yes, that, that passage, yeah. Sort yeah. of implying that only um, it's a choice land for God's people and it'll be kept from other nations. So there shouldn't be other civilizations there, uh, except for maybe, you know, the Jaredites who were led there or, you know, Levi right. and his family. So there shouldn't be all this intermingling. And that's, that's a convenient way to say, oh, we can't find, you know, right. the, the DNA because they've just intermingled and then they were, they were they were killed off, you know, a lot of them in the final battle. Uh, you, you do allude that there is some studies I have in here in Asia, a 2013 study and 14 study confirming some Middle Eastern DNA. Um, you referenced that in your CS. I haven't well, yeah, but I also uh, well, I don't know if I reference that system where I apply, but but there, there's a group of people called the, that call themselves the Heartlanders. Heartlanders. Oh, yes, right, Rod yeah. Meldrum uh haplogroup x and I, I i am wandering into an area where i know next to nothing and what scares me though is that rod meldrum also knows next to nothing but talks about this with a certainty that would make any scientist uncomfortable yeah my, my understanding is that it doesn't date to book, book of mormon yeah it dates, he doesn't agree it, with the dating well, yeah. He, well, he believes in a young Earth. He believes yeah. that the Earth is only six thousand years old, and so the fact that this haplogroup, which is consistent both in North America, in a small group in North America, and in the Middle East, 
uh, it's it, it dates back, you know, long before Lehi would have gotten there, like twelve thousand BC. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, uh, but the point, but 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 I think the broader point is, a scientist will tell you that yeah, from what we can tell, we can only identify um, largely an Asiatic influence in Native American mitochondrial DNA. Uh, what Ugo Perigo points out is that uh, a, that kind of a genetic trace is only uh, passed down maternally. It's not passed down paternally, which means that if if at one generation you don't you only have daughters or you have sons that don't reproduce, um, or, or you know, or, or you only have sons and you don't have daughters who reproduce, that that marker disappears. And points out that there are civilizations that are far younger where earlier paternal DNA markers have disappeared. Right, it's they, kind of like genetic like, drift, isn't it? Like genetic the... drift. I mean, well, well, and, and it gets more complicated by the idea of okay, so what should we expect Lehi's DNA to have looked like? Well, we assume it would look like the DNA of somebody in the 21st century who's Middle Eastern. But why do we assume that? We assume that that those markers have survived unchanged over the course of millennia. Uh, you know, there there are just so many different factors that it. Uh, I, I mean, I would certainly prefer, from an apologetic standpoint, for you know the DNA to scream, "Hey, guess what, everybody? These guys were Middle East. These guys were Jews," uh, and it certainly does not do that. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what, what should we expect the DNA markers of the Jaredites to have been? What should we expect? Uh, Orson Scott Card, uh, uh, do you know, you know, Orson Scott Card? No. Orson Scott Card, he's kind of fallen out of favor lately, but, uh, I think he's probably the, the best fiction writer that the church has ever produced. He's a science fiction writer. He wrote the book Ender's Game. Um, anyway, he, he's hmm. and then he and then he got in big trouble um, because he wrote a bunch of anti-gay stuff that got him sort of blackballed in uh, the literary world. Um, but uh, anyway, backing up, Orson Scott Card wrote an, wrote an essay called Art Artifact or Artifice. And he offered the possibility that the Mulekites were not Middle Eastern, that the Mulekites were either descendants of Jared or Jaredites. But in order to get along and with the um, with the Nephites, just announce themselves as as Middle Eastern. Hmm. And so everybody Didn't he claimed to be the son of Zedekiah. The son of Zedekiah, okay. yeah, yeah. You'll have to go to his, but. Since then, I have heretically bought into Orson Scott Card's argument and think that that this is them inter intermarrying with a group that chose a label of somebody that the Israelites would have known and respected in order to be able to build a relationship, and that there isn't necessarily a genetic link there. Uh, that is probably a heretical, terrible thing to believe. <laughs> and I don't think anybody else has to believe it, but I think Orson Scott Card and I are both on that same page. Uh, the point being, the broader point being is, is that what we can definitively know about the ancient DNA of anybody that lived 2000 years ago is so slight that to say what we do know now precludes the existence of the Nephites and the Lamanites is just a huge huge overreach okay that's ground um so uh jeremy talks about anachronisms in the book of mormon he most, mostly focus on um sort of things with archaeology and some of the animals so you know the book of mormon talks about horses sheep cattle pigs goats elephants wheels and that these all didn't exist in the americas prior to columbus and he also says that there's a lack of archaeological evidence i think he says there's no archaeological evidence to support the Book of Mormon. Uh, I'd like to give your response on, you know, critics attacking the anachronisms in the Book of Mormon and just your thoughts about lack of archaeological evidence. Uh, 
I, it is wrong to say there is no archaeological evidence uh, for the Book of Mormon because there is a considerable amount of archaeological evidence for the first 40 pages of the Book of Mormon, which take place in a specifically geographically identifiable spot. Uh, Lehi's travel through and his family through the, the Arabian desert. Lehi's travel through the Arabian desert has has been uh, confirmed in really sort of miraculous ways, uh, in ways that critics are not willing to allow. It's not just the existence of Nahum, which is an ancient burial altar that exists exactly at the place where Joseph Smith said it was and where the Book of Mormon said it was, and it was unknown uh, at the time that the Book of Mormon was published. The incense trail that uh, Lehi took uh, is a, ha, has been discovered as a sort of um, a, a, an ancient trade route that was unknown in, in 1830 and has since later been discovered. Um, you know, the land bountiful where you have a mountain full of ore where Joseph could build a ship and this lush, beautiful paradise. Or Nephi. Uh, yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a spot right there in Oman that fits the description perfectly. Uh, that's exactly where it would need to be in order to fulfill what the Book of Mormon... I mean, I mean, so, so that isn't proof that the Book of Mormon is true, but it is certainly evidence. And you, you have to delineate between evidence and proof. Well, that's uh, it, because my thought whenever there's that question, there's no archaeological evidence... Um, People might interpret Nahum and Bountiful and Lehi's travel through the, the Arabian desert as good archaeological evidence, not proof. And some may interpret it as just a coincidence. You know, it, it's, right, right, right. You can't authenticate and, and, it. And that's the nature of what evidence is. It, it, you know, you you have it's the reason we have a court system where people use exactly the same evidence to offer diametrically opposed positions. You say, okay, here's here's a piece of evidence. Uh, this is how I interpret that evidence. This is what that evidence means. The defense and the prosecution interpret that exact same evidence entirely differently. Mm, yeah. um, so, so it is not true to say there is no evidence. It is true to say there is no proof. Yeah. Now, it becomes a whole lot more difficult in the new world because we don't know where this this stuff took place for most of the history of the church. People assumed it took place all across northern and southern, the entire um, western hemisphere, and that the narrow neck of land was Panama and the and the isthmus. You know, uh, it, it's it's uh, the isthmus of Panama. Um, oh shoot! Uh, can we pause and, yes. and come back? No problem. Is that terrible. No, that's okay.